um, open up our Bibles to Exodus chapter 7. Amen? Praise the Lord. So open up your Bibles, Exodus chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. Praise the Lord. Exodus chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. I just want to share a brief exhortation from the word of the Lord that has been stirring in my heart. Amen. And it kind of, I believe it was probably a birth out of uh, last week's message, which is a call for the church to be aware, amen, of the, of the Antichrist spirit that is lurking in these days that is trying to deceive the church and trying to confuse the body of believers. Um, and the seduction is strong and the seduction is real, amen, to try to call believers into a place of complacency where we're willing to compromise the truths of the gospel and the demands of living righteous before God um, for the sake of a more comfortable gospel, for an uh, uncommitted gospel. And this is uh, something that is uh, extremely dangerous for believers to embrace. And um, when I call an antichrist spirit, I'm not talking about the antichrist, which the Bible does speak about, but it's that, that atmosphere uh, uh, of, of, of deception that the enemy brings about in our day, in our day today, that is already at work. And we saw last week how the apostle says it's already at work at his day, and he was understanding that we were living in the last days. And so we as a church today have to embrace this reality that we too are living in that environment of the Antichrist spirit. Just whatever opposes the truth of the gospel is part of that Antichrist spirit. And so the Lord has laid this message on my heart, and I'm going to just share that with you guys. Are you ready to go? All right. So let me know you're ready with Exodus 7 with an amen. Amen. All right. Exodus chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. Read along with me. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into, the, into Pharaoh and they did so just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. So the magicians of Egypt, they, so the magicians, excuse me, so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods and Pharaoh's heart grew hard and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Praise God. The Lord has put upon my heart a urgency. Uh, and this is something that I was reading in, in the past. And it's something that um, just uh, I studied this in the past. And it came back to my remembrance in recent times. And it's just this alert, this warning in my heart. Especially given the climate of the body of Christ and the things that are going on in the world. That we are to pay attention to enchanters in the church. Yeah. Pay attention to those who are deceptive and those who are really uh, uh, what we say oh, the, the best word for it is really an enchanter someone who mesmerizes the church who is, who is out there trying to deceive and distract the church by way of their enchantments and the Lord was saying that, that we have to be aware of the power of enchanters but specifically within the church and I want to specify and qualify that statement by really calling our attention to what it means when we say enchanters in the church because the fact of the matter is that if you are the church of Jesus Christ you should not be an enchanter and so when I use that word in the church, I mean it in the way we use it now casually in the building of the church, not really in the body of believers that is the church. How many know that the church is not a building? It's the people of God. And so the enchanters in the church, I don't mean it. I don't think the Spirit was hinting at that, that he was saying that in, amongst us believers that there are enchanters, but rather among us believers there are enchanters. And so within the church buildings, in the places of fellowship, where we gather together, there are those who are rising up who are enchanters within the body of Christ. And they have every position from people in the pews to people on the pulpits. And so God is just really highlighting that on my heart. And it speaks to what Jesus had said concerning the end times where he was describing that, um, that the, the, the weeds would grow together with the wheat. And that's a reality. And he says, Don't, I'm not going to rip out the weed. Because if I rip out the weed, I might rip out some of the wheat as well. That means that if we try to cast out or if God tried to remove those who are enchanters right now, it would cause damage to those who are the real Christians because they would be deceived and so offended or so affected by their removal. And so the Bible says, let the, weed grow, let the weeds grow with the wheat because on the Lord's day, he will separate them out. And so that will happen when the Lord comes to judge. But up until now, we understand that we are living in an environment that's going to be a compromised environment. It's going to be an environment that's going to be mixed with a type of people that come together. And there's this expression in Spanish. I'm not sure if it translates well into English. But no todo lo que son, son. Right? Like that not everyone who is here... Uh, that doesn't make sense in English. Basically what it means is that not everyone who's a part of the church, who's really a part, who's in the church is part of the church. Let's put it that way. It's hard to explain, translate that expression. But the point is that we as believers have to live our lives 
not just trusting that that's a man of God because he has a microphone, but that we are testing the spirit and discerning the fruit of, the, of their lives. You should not be sitting here on a Sunday. Well, it's Pastor Bernie preaching, so everything he says must be the gospel. We should be searching the scriptures and making sure that everything that is said from this pulpit actually matches up with the word of God. And you need to do that for yourself. Somebody say, somebody say I got to do that for myself. I love that you know, both myself and Gary and other ministers, we have this sense of accountability. If you, don't, if you want to know where I found that in scripture, ask me. We'll send you the verses. Because we have to be self-accountable, and as believers, you have to be accountable for that which you receive as truth. We should be testing the Spirit. I love the, the example of the Berean people in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, right? Uh, the Apostle Paul is preaching to the Bereans, and when they heard him, they were like, oh, that's great. We'll get right back to you. And the Bible says that they went away, and they searched out in the Scriptures to see if everything he was saying was actually true. Imagine trying to fact-check past the Apostle Paul. Right? They were fact-checking and making sure that everything he said, even him, the apostle, amen, if it was really from the Lord, they would use the word of God and go back. And I love that mentality. I think that we need to have that mentality as believers as well, that we're constantly fact-checking our leaders and fact-checking the preachers that we listen to and fact-checking the people who rise up and it doesn't matter how big their ministry is, it doesn't matter how many people follow them or how many people like their profile, you need to check for yourself, is this in the word of God? How many say amen? In today's text, I want to examine some things that I think are just so interesting and so remarkable. And it's probably unparalleled in Scripture what took place in this text. And I, I want to give a little bit of background about this text before we go and unpack the actual event that took place in that chapter. The Lord here um, has been working with the life of Moses and has called Moses in, during this time for a specific message of bringing a message of deliverance to the people of Israel. And that message was a very clear and concise message of hope. And it sounded something like this. Pharaoh, let my people go. And the beauty of that message, and I'm, I'm going to definitely preach on that another day, so I'm not going to unpack it too much. So pardon my enthusiasm. But that message was really a message that is so resounding. It's saying, come out of Egypt. But the message wasn't just let my people go. That's the part that gets really famous. But it actually has a little bit more to it. It says, Pharaoh, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. And that worship me part, that it's really let my people go, let them come out of Egypt so that they can come into my presence. And it's a message of hope and a message uh, that really was defiant to the wishes of the Pharaoh. And in that interaction, I'm not going to go too much into it, but five, Moses will ask God five questions. And all five of his questions were questions of doubt, questions of insecurity. He was saying, but, you know, I don't even know how to talk. And, you know, what happens if this happens? And what will I do if this happens? And God's, you know, just kind of doing one of these. Oh, boy. Come on, I am sending you. If I send you, of course I'm going to empower you. And for all five of Moses' questions of reasons why he shouldn't go and why he should pick someone else, God gives him five reasons why he should be encouraged and why he should know that God would be with him. And God ultimately, you know, just patiently answers every one of his concerns. And then the final question we see that Moses says, you know what, I, I, I'm not the one, send someone else. And God finally sees that, that his real objections wasn't doubt, it was just outright denial. And God really, you know, works with his heart. And as a result of Moses' refusal to, you know, just be submitted to God's leadership in the calling he was making upon his life, God says, you know what, I'm going to give you someone. And God passes away the honor of being God's spokesman. He passes it on to Aaron. Now, later on, I'm not sure what happens. The Bible doesn't describe. Moses will get his act together and will become the spokesperson on his own. But because of this moment in particular, Moses is so stricken with, with insecurity and doubt on God's power that he will accept this helper to come, Aaron, his actual physical brother, to come and help him and, and to fulfill his uh, task. Now, going back to the text of today, by this time that this happens in this particular text, Moses has gotten his act together and he's armed with a very powerful message. And it's a message that I think is such an interesting message with, in terms of the duality that it has, the parallel that it has for us as the church with the message of salvation of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because the message that Moses had received is a message that's similar to the forerunner message that we carry as believers. Let me explain what that means. That forerunner message, forerunner is the title that we give to John the Baptist, right? He was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. That means that he came to prepare what? The way for the coming of the Lord. And he was the forerunner of Jesus Christ for Jesus' first arrival, his first um, appearance on the earth in the incarnate person of Jesus. But now we also know that we, the church, carry a forerunner message as well. Our message is to prepare the way for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the messages are very similar in nature, right? It's a clear and simple message. 
For Moses, it was let my people go to worship me in the wilderness. For us, it's repent and know Jesus, know Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life and be saved and have a relationship with God. Amen. For Moses, the message, uh, God gave him a holy name. Moses said, Who, in whose name shall I go? And he says, tell them that the great I am sent you. For us as Christians, in whose name do we go and preach the gospel? In the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, for Moses, God gave him wonder-working power, the ability to run, work out you know, certain signs. And for us, we do what? Signs and wonders, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. For Moses, he needed help. He felt that he was incompetent, so God gives him Aaron. We receive the Holy Spirit of God that empowers us and gives us the words, the language that we feel we don't have. Amen. So there's this beautiful parallel between the calling of Moses and the calling of the church to be that, that forerunner messenger in these last times. And I think there's a, there's a great picture here that we will see that will go a little bit further. If we go a little bit further to this scene, we'll see that there continues to be a great picture between the state of the church today and the experience that Moses was going through in the scripture. First off, what we find is that Moses had a rod. Somebody say a rod. Excuse me, a rod. <clears throat> Moses had a rod in his hand. And it's very significant to observe this rod that God would give him. As he approaches God, God asks Moses, Moses, what do you have in your hand? And Moses says, I have this rod. Now, in the hand of a shepherd, a rod is a very obvious thing. But in Egypt, where Moses was going to go to, a rod had a different significance. When you carried a rod in Egypt, it was an emblem of wealth, power, and authority. Only wealthy people had rods in Egypt, right? Because they weren't farmers. The Egyptians were very wealthy people. They had slaves who did all of their labors. So when you would walk around the streets of Egypt with a rod, it means you had status. It means you had authority. A rod was a symbol of authority. And the Egyptians who were very uh, powerful, who were very rich, who were very authoritarian, right? They would carry these elegant and ornate rods as a way of promoting and demonstrating just how powerful and authoritative they were. But how interesting it is that Moses was carrying a symbol of authority, but it had total humility. It was a shepherd's rod. It had no beauty in it, no elegance in it. But he had an authority that was empowered by God of heaven. So that when he would walk into the cities, it was clear that he had authority. But that the authority was not in the appearance, but in the invisible God that was backing it up. Because we serve a God who loves to exalt the weak things. He loves to use the weak things and the humble things in order to humble the great things. Amen. And so he would carry a shepherd's rod, the lowliest of jobs, but have more authority than the greatest one in the, in the palace of Egypt. Hallelujah. I'll praise him if you don't. That's all right. And so the Lord was demonstrating the uniqueness of, of Moses' authority. Being the meekest man on the earth, his rod reflected that. Amen. But he would have the authority of God fully invested behind him. To such an extent, this rod was very unique. This rod was empowered by God. Such that when he would throw the rod on the ground, it would actually turn into a serpent. Now, most of you would not want that ministry or that calling because I realize that you're afraid of serpents or snakes, right? But nevertheless, this was the grace and the gift that Moses received. Now, let's talk about this serpent. Why would God choose of all things a serpent? Why couldn't it let it turn into a cute little guinea pig or a rabbit, right? Now, that's a good question, but let's explain that. God gave him the power to take his rod and turn it into a serpent for a number of reasons. First of all, let's look at their context. In Egypt, the serpent was a source of evil power. It was a symbol of evil power. And many people in Egypt had died, had fallen prey to a snake bite that ultimately resulted in their death. So therefore, the snake was also a symbol of judgment. It was a symbol of evil power as well as judgment. So the fact that Moses could command a staff to turn into that which was a symbol of evil and justice, or rather or judgment, was a symbol that the authority that was invested in Moses was a power greater than the power of sin and death. Like the God who was empowering Moses, as Moses can come, or listen, he would not only throw down the staff and it would turn to a snake, but he would take the snake by the what? By the tail. Now, have you ever seen a, a snake handler? How do they uh, handle the snakes? The first thing they do is with another stick, they pin down the head, and then they grab it. Have you ever seen that? They use another Why? Because if you grab a snake by its tail, what will it do? It will turn around and stab you and sting you. So the fact that God says, when you grab it, I want you to take your left hand, not your right hand, not your strong hand, take your weak hand, grab the snake by its tail, and it'll turn back to a staff. You see, it's all to demonstrate that the power of God, and he gets all, it's all the power of God, and he gets the glory in it all. That you have nothing to do with it. And he was showing now the Pharaoh. He was showing the Pharaoh in all of Egypt and even God's own people that the God who was carrying this message or, carry, or, or who was in depositing this message of deliverance through Moses was the God who had the power and authority over their greatest fears, over sin and death itself. 
And so Moses is walking in that authority. And there's one more thing as well. It would be so significant for Moses to throw down the staff at the feet of Pharaoh and pick it right back up because the Pharaoh is also called, does anybody know, the great serpent. His, one of his great titles, one of his many titles in Scripture, according to Ezekiel, is that he would be called a great serpent. And so when he would pick up the snake by the tail, he was literally saying, and the God that I serve who's sending me, he's actually got more power than you. He has authority and power over you as well. So this was all a manifestation, a sign and a wonder that would point to the fact that what Moses was carrying was ultimately and absolutely indubitably supported and backed by God himself. Why? Because he was doing things that only God can do. And so God would empower him with these gifts. In Ezekiel 29, you know, uh, Pharaoh being called a serpent, he would empower him with gifts to humble the Pharaoh and to demonstrate that the authority that Moses was walking on, don't be confused by the stick, rock that he, the stick rod that he has. The message and the power he carries is one that can control even the Pharaoh's heart. Amen. And so all of this comes into play as we understand what was taking place. Now, what happens next is completely blindsided. Like it, it just, it completely blindswipes everyone. Uh, everyone in the community, I mean, in the, not in the community, everyone in, the, in their presence, uh, even Moses himself didn't expect this to happen. The Bible says that he throws down his staff. He goes, okay, here's the proof that God has sent me. Throws down his staff, the snake does his thing. And he goes, okay, I can easily pick it up now. But just before he can pick it up, something happens. The Pharaoh calls his men. He calls what the Bible calls his wise men to come in. And these wise men were enchanters. The Bible says that word wise men are expert in the secret arts of enchantment. And he calls them in. And he calls them, his, he calls them his powerful men, the text that we just read. And what they were able to do, these wise men, is they're able to reproduce three out of the four first uh, signs and wonders that Moses does. And they throw their rods. Each of them throws a rod on the ground. So now Moses' single snake or serpent is now being challenged by two other serpents. Amen. So now what does Moses do? Moses has to sit back and see the salvation of the Lord. He stands back. God gave him no instructions for this. God did not prepare him. And when they throw theirs, I want you to give the snake a command or, or maybe throw down another snake. No, God just says throw down the staff and it will turn into a snake. When this happened, this caused awe. Because what do you do when the enemy creates something that looks just like God did it as well? What do you do when the enemy brings a message and, and manifests a power that looks like the things that Christians can do too? What do you do when we heal by the power of the name of Jesus, but the world heals, the dem demons heal as well? When people can go to witchcraft and sorcerers and all this and receive healing as well. What do we do as believers with that? When the enemy can try to match, play for play, the things that Christians seem to be able to match. That our message sounds like their message. How do you know the difference if the powers seem the same? So this is where I began to wrestle with this text. Because it bothered me. Lord, how can you let that dirty devil match what you did? And even how do they do it? How do they, how do they make that even possible? You know, there's something very interesting about this text here and something very interesting is actually about history. And I'll, uh, I'll show with you, I'll share you, with you guys a little bit of what I was able to research historically because this really began to bother me. Like, how did they pull this off? And there's this document called the, the West Car Papyrus, right? The papyrus are old scrolls. And the West Car Papyrus, uh, papyrus describes um, how enchanters in those days used to operate. And um, there's something called the, uh, the Egyptian scarabs. Anybody ever hear of scarabs? That little black looking uh, beetle looking thing, right? The Egyptian scarabs were also a group of mystics, all right? And there is a lot of history that surrounds and describes how they would be able to perform enchantment or magic tricks or deception tools in, the, in their day. Not referring necessarily, to, can you guys still hear me? All right. Not referring necessarily to, to Moses' as a, a moment, but this was something that they were doing routinely. And what we know from history and from just kind of reading is that they were able to do two things that really weren't, well, one of them at least wasn't really a, a source of power. It was a source of deception. What they would actually do is called catalepsy. There is a way for certain species of snakes that you can grab them by the nape of their neck and they actually become stiffened. And you're able to hold them as if they were a rod the entire time until you release the grip. And so they were able to perform certain things that appeared like what God was doing, but it wasn't real. They were masterful in deception. And we know this from history, not even from the Bible. We know this from history. So now we can take that reality that we know from history and we can extrapolate it to this incident and probably suggest the fact that, yeah, maybe they, they were actually some of these Egyptian scarabs, right? These were the people who knew how to perform magic tricks and entertain people. And people would be wowed and wooed by what they do. And what it would do is that it would lend credibility to the power that you supposedly have. 
but it was all just a deception. And today we have things, I don't know if you've ever seen a, a magic show or, a, or one of these illusionists. They perform things, and you're like, I don't even know how they did that. It, that that's got to be the devil. Now, probably mirrors, probably other you know, sleights of hand, but it just feels uncanny when you cannot explain what you're seeing with your eyes, yes or no. That's called deception. That's called magic. And so that is the source of what they were practicing in those days. And so when Moses, by the power of God, turned a real stick into a real snake, they tried to imitate that with the fake. They try to imitate that with, with, with uh, uh, illusions and with, with uh, the sorcery and all of this kind of enchantments. But there is another possibility as well that we cannot discard because it comes out of Scripture. And that is that there is a real thing called sorcery. There is a real uh, demonically, satanically induced ability to perform incredible wonders, incredible signs by the power of the devil as well. And so there's a possibility that it could have been catalepsy, that it could have been some trick of, of illusion, but it could have actually also been a demonic influence, a demonic power manifested in that moment. And so what happens is they now are not able to uh, 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 overpower what God, what God did, but they're able to imitate it as well. And so um, I'm going to make sure I don't miss where I am. Um, the Bible speaks, excuse me, I'm sorry. This is what happens when I don't have enough time to study the way I want to because I, I have all these great points and I don't want to miss a single thing. What the Bible here describes for us then is that we have to be able to appreciate the fact that there's, there's other sources of powers at work. But one of the things I think is so awesome is that in the end, in the end, although the enemy was able to reproduce it, he cannot overpower what God did. The Bible says that the snake of God would now devour the other two snakes that they had created. And so what that speaks to, I'm going to break down in just a couple minutes, but I want you to appreciate the fact that although the enemy always wants to imitate what God does, the enemy cannot create anything at all. All he knows how to do is take what God has created, imitate it, or corrupt it. It's the nature of Satan to be a master imitator and a master corrupter, but he cannot create anything. He is not a creator. And so he does nothing original. What all he can do is take what is of God and try to corrupt it for the sake of his own purposes. And the Pharaoh was using these men in order to validate his own authority and power as a deity. Because he commanded them to do it, people would now praise and worship Pharaoh because they thought that because he was imitating God's work, he must be a God himself. But God was not going to leave that at that. This is what we call the Antichrist spirit. Just so that you can appreciate that it's not the source of it. It doesn't always have to be trickery or illusions, but it could also be by the power of Satan himself. 2 Thessalonians, please, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Look at what it says. It says, and then the lawless one will be revealed, speaking of the Antichrist, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. On the Lord's day, when Jesus comes, he will destroy the Antichrist. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. And he looks, listen to the works of Satan. They will be what? They will be all with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So here we see how the Antichrist will be able to operate, not through deception, but through real demonic power. Amen. If we're talking about that in our day, we're seeing Antichrist spirit operating in our days, then we have to be able to realize that the enemy is trying to forfeit or counterfeit the things of God through the imitation of the real thing in order to discredit God or in order to distract us from what is really from the Lord. How many say amen to that? The Bible actually describes the names of these two men, and it's not given to us the names in the book of Exodus, but it's given to us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. It says, and now Janus and Jambers, that's the name of the two guys, these two guys who would throw down their rods by the Pharaoh's command. They resisted Moses, so that these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt mind disapproved concerning the faith of God. I think it's interesting to note that their condemnation doesn't come as a result of the source of their power. Their condemnation comes from the result of their rejection of the truth that they saw. They knew what they were performing, had no power, but they saw what Moses did, really had power. And their condemnation comes from their refusal to accept the truth. And as a result, this proved the faith. Amen? And so just, just an important point I want to bring there. But for all of us today... What does that mean? What does that teach us? What can we learn in terms of an application from um, what Moses experienced? And that, that, what is a parallel for us today? The parallel for us today is that we too are surrounded by master enchanters. And their job and their influence and their efforts are all to try to distract the believers and to try to entertain believers. All they try to do is take a message that sounds like the holy word. It sounds and looks like the works of God, but it has something that is off. 
just enough that it will deviate your attentions from God onto a man or from God onto self. Their message sounds pious. Their message sounds um, godly. But in reality, when you hear things like, um, um, you know, uh, God wants to make you wealthier, God, that sounds like it's godly because it says God, but doesn't mean that God is in that message. How many say what I'm saying? And then so, and not, and that's not to say I'm not against God making someone well. I'm not against God prospering someone. But that is not God's decree for his church. That is not what he is planning to give us all. That is an erroneous gospel of prosperity message that is being preached throughout the world. And like that message, there are many messages today that are being declared on television. People, and it's not just in the church, it's outside of the church. People are going to talk show hosts and they're listening to, to what philosophers are saying. And they're listening to new age speakers and they're practicing all kinds of things. All of which sound godly but are not. It is the enchanters in our midst. Is the enchanter spirit in our heart, in, in our environment, even within the church? There are enchanters who rise up and through so called signs and wonders try to distract the church from true devotion and true repentance and true brokenness to going after certain things that seem like benefits that God wants for me, but in reality are just satisfying your selfish desires. God is calling us to be aware of the enchanters in our midst. They are elaborate messengers and they speak with great eloquence, but their appeal is completely carnal. They're emotional and mental uh, self-empowerment gurus in the body of Christ. They preach a gospel that has no commitment and requires no confrontation of sin in your life. They try to seduce the weak and they try to deceive those who are spiritually blind. They are enchanters and power by Satan to reproduce miracles and signs and wonders that look like they belong from the Lord, but they are not. And when we see that both the, the enemy can throw down snakes and when we can throw down snakes, how do we know? How can we know when it's of the Lord? I want to bear this out with you, that what made Moses authoritarian or authoritative in his message wasn't the fact that he had a serpent that he could throw down, because clearly the enemy could do that and did it twice. What made him authoritarian, authoritative in his message is that he had the message from the great messenger, our God. It was the fact that he carried the message from God to let God's people go. That was just a sign and a wonder that, that affirmed the fact that the messenger was real. But the enemy was able to reproduce that message, but not reproduce the message itself in the heart of Moses. What was Moses' message that was contrary to the, Moses, to the message of the Pharaoh? Moses' message was, come out of Egypt, my people, and go into the wilderness, to the place of brokenness, to the place of isolation, to spend time with me in worship. But what was the message of the Pharaoh? The message of the Pharaoh is, don't leave. Stay here in Egypt. It's more comfortable for you here in Egypt. Don't pack up your stuff and go. How many know that Egypt is a symbol of the world? Yeah. Amen. It's a symbol of the world. And so there's this message that prevails even in our day today that you don't have to really change from the world. You don't have to leave Egypt in order to be saved. You can just stay comfortable here in Egypt. And we see that that message prevailed in the hearts of Israel because when they were in the wilderness finally with God, what, what did they keep saying? I remember back in Egypt, we used to eat you know, onion soup, and we used to be able to have all the pita bread and hummus we wanted. They began to whine and complain about all the things they had in Egypt because that's the messenger of the Antichrist. That's the Antichrist spirit. It's a message that tells you, stay comfortable, stay put. Don't inconvenience yourself. God loves you anyway. He loves everyone. That is a false message. And it gives a false hope to anyone who believes that you can stay in your sin and stay in the world and not leave Egypt to go out into the wilderness, to live out in holiness for the Lord. There's a self-idea that promotes a, self, a, a false sense of security that I am fine just the way I am and that God loves me just like this. That is a lie of the scriptures, a lie, a lie of the devil against the scriptures. The Bible tells us that God does love you as you are, but he cannot have you as you are. You must repent and come to him and give him your life. Outside of that, you, you're listening to what you're embracing in your heart is an enchantment of the, of the enemy. It's a deception. It sounds godly. It sounds beautiful to say God loves everyone. He does love everyone, but there's more to that message. The message is he loves everyone, and because he loves us, he gives us an opportunity to repent, to truly surrender our hearts to him, to come out of Egypt, and go worship him in the wilderness. That's the complete message. The Pharaoh wanted them to stay. He didn't want them to be inconvenienced. He wanted them to, to continue to be slaves of Egypt. And that's the lie. Their signs and wonders, what they do, promote the flesh and convenience. And, 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 it, and it makes you comfortable in this world when the true gospel of Jesus Christ calls you out of the world and into the wilderness to go and worship your God. How many say amen? amen. The fact that there is... A, 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 a mantle on our lives, like Moses had a mantle upon his life to cast the rod down. There's also a calling on our lives 
to be willing to throw down our rods. The Bible describes that the Bible itself compares to a rod. We need to be willing to throw down our rod, the confrontational message of Jesus Christ. Not be afraid to preach a message that requires commitment. The simple gospel of Jesus Christ is there is salvation through no one else, through, not through works, not through anybody, but only through Christ alone. We are called to not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That the power of God will always confront the power of Satan. And what will happen? Just like Moses the serpent devoured the, the serpents of Janus and Jambers, so will the message of truth always devour the lies of the enemy. The message of truth will always reveal and expose and devour the deception. The message of truth will always devour the bondages through its deliverance. We have to be willing to be bold like Moses, to throw down the message, to be clear in our preaching of the gospel, to be clear in what we believe and where we stand. And no matter what the enemy does, he will not be able to deceive us because we stand in the light of God's truth. I want to read these three texts of scripture and I want to challenge you to think about what is the gospel that you've embraced in your heart. What is this message that the Lord has called us to, to be bearers of, like Moses was called to be a bearer of. Especially in our day today, we are called to not only be bearers of this message, but to be protectors of this message. And how you preach and how you teach and what you are, we allow on our pulpits, we have to be protectors of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to this message. I'm going to ask you to please stand for this. We're going to end with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 6. Speaking of the word of God that we carry, look what it says. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For what? For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing down every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your disobedience, when your obedience is fulfilled. What is that saying? It's saying that the word of God is the snake, the serpent, that swallows up the serpents of the lies of the enemy. It's able to bring and expose the lies of the enemy. And it's able to take captive any lie that we've embraced in our hearts and bring it into submission to God. Matthew 7, 21, verse 23, 21 to 23. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have, not prophet have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare, says Jesus, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's speaking that in our day, there's going to be many who will throw down serpents like we throw down our staff. And they will say, Lord, in your name we did this and we did a lot of things in your name. And the Lord will still say, apart from me, I don't know you. You cannot be moved by the wonders and the signs that people perform. The Bible says you will know them by their fruits, by their lives that they live, not by the things that they perform. And so we are called to be testing the spirits constantly with the word of God and ensuring they truly are from God. Just because they look godly doesn't mean it comes from God. For Janice and Jambers were able to reproduce things that look godly, but ultimately were consumed by the word of God. And Romans chapter 1 verse 16 is the final verse. It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also for the Greek. We cannot be ashamed of the gospel. We cannot be intimidated by how many other serpents seem to match our message. The moment, about how many other lies this world is throwing out against us. It is neither popular nor is it the majority to be a strong believer today. Yet everyone calls himself a Christian. Everyone says they believe in Christ. But on that day, many the Lord will say, I don't know you. Don't be afraid to stand in the gospel. Don't be afraid to preach the full and complete gospel the truth of God. We who know the truth of God are not preaching it as loudly as we should. I want to challenge you today. Don't be afraid to throw down your rod. Close your eyes. God told Moses, throw down that rod. That throwing down of the rod demonstrated that he was not afraid of what that message was going to provoke. He knew that it would provoke the Pharaoh who was called the great serpent. He knew that it would provoke reactions of, of anger. And it wasn't politically correct. And it was so disrespectful what Moses did. But he threw down the rod anyway. And the enemy came out with him with other things that sounded just as good and looked just as good. But ultimately the truth of God prevailed. Because God always backs his word. Because the, the weapons of our warfare, the word of God that we preach is not of this world. It's not carnal. It's not your words. It's your mouth. But it's the word of God. And it's empowered by God who speaks it. And he just gives us the authority in the spirit. Just as Moses had Aaron, we have the Holy Spirit of God who is our helper. 
to give us the boldness to throw down that message and not be so concerned with how they receive it. Let God deal with their hearts. I'm not saying to be indifferent. No, I'm not saying that. Be wise. Be sensitive. But love them more than you love your reputation with them. I would stake my reputation with someone. If it means they may not like me after I say it, if it means that I can save them from hell. But we got to be willing to hold on to that rod and throw it down when the Lord says, speak and show them my salvation. And let God swallow up the lies. Let God swallow up the deceptions that they're struggling with. Let God demonstrate that your message is real in their hearts. Our job is just to throw down the rod, to preach the gospel and not be afraid. There's a message that we carry. A message that prepares the way for the coming of the Lord. To reach to the lost and to say that God loves them, but he cannot embrace you until there's repentance in your heart. He loves you, but he cannot welcome you into his presence, into his heaven. He can't make you part of his people. You cannot be his son or daughter if you're still living for this world and living by the will of your own will or the, or the enemy, the Satan. Choose this day whom you will serve. I want to urge you, if you're in this room right now, you're listening to this message and, you're, and it confronts the, the, the lies you've embraced in your heart. Or because you understand that there's accountability on your life to share this message you've been afraid to throw down your rod. I want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. But I want to invite the room all together. We all have this charge to be like Moses in the, in the wilderness of this world right now. To not be afraid to call out those who are in Egypt declaring the truth that God is calling you out to come out of Egypt and come and worship him, come and know him, come and experience the love of the Father. He is the answer to the things that we search for. He's the answer for the things that we long for, the emptiness of our hearts, the things that we try to entertain our lives and our hearts and our emotions with. He's the answer for it all. So I want to invite you right now to let's just come forward to the altar of saints. Let's just spend some time responding to the word of the Lord. And ask the Lord to give you boldness. This invitation, by the way, is just for everyone, not just anyone who wants to give their hearts to the Lord, but just anyone who would like to just say, God, make me bold, Lord. Help me be bolder to, to preach the gospel. Help me to be zealous, oh God, to, to, to ensure that the message I'm carrying is, is pure and not this watered-down message that is comfortable for anyone to, to receive so that they don't have to change or feel that they are inconvenienced. God, we pray in Jesus' name. Search our hearts tonight, oh God. Search our hearts, O oh Lord. Help us, O oh Lord, my God, to weed out the enchantments of the enemy that we've embraced. To weed out the deceptions of the enemy that we have called true. Help us, O oh Lord, my God, 